so you've found the perfect home. But high mortgage rates have you second guessing. The Churchill Mortgage Team says waiting to buy can be a costly mistake. Try their free 15 minute analysis to see the difference between buying now versus waiting for lower rates. Visit churchillmortgage.com to learn a smarter way to build wealth through home ownership. This is a paid advertisement. NMLS ID 1591, NMLS consumeraccess.org, Equal Housing Lender, 1749 Mallory Lane, Suite 100, Brentwood, Tennessee 37027. The holidays start here at Baker's with a variety of options to celebrate traditions old and new. Whether you're making a traditional roasted turkey or spicy turkey tacos, your go-to shrimp cocktail, or your first Cajun risotto, Baker's has all the freshest ingredients to embrace your traditions. Baker's, fresh for everyone. We've locked in low prices to help you save big store-wide. Look for the locked in low prices tags and enjoy extra savings throughout the store. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Hello there, Andrew Dunkley here, the host of Space Nuts. Nice to have your company once again and again and again. We won't go into that. Uh, Hope you're well. Stick around because we've got a lot coming up on this episode and that includes um, Saturn doing a bit of a moon at us, um, multiple moons in fact. Uh, Also the largest cosmic explosion yet seen. We will also be answering audience questions uh, about black holes. Yep. Uh, asteroid redirection, and Paul's got an issue with the Martian movie. We'll find out about all of that and more on this episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me as always is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hi, Fred. Hi, Andrew. How how are you? Sorry, you just disappeared there for a minute. How are you? Not again. (laughs) Yeah, but you came back. Uh, That's all right. We've had the wonderful disappearing act this morning. Yeah, it's been crazy, hasn't it? Mm. Uh, I am well. I am really well. And you? Likewise. Uh, Good, good. Very well and... uh, I'm, you know, always, uh, always happy to wake up in the morning and find that nothing's dropped off. Or yeah, there you go. Mm. Come, yeah. Comes with a certain age, Andrew. You'll get there, don't worry. I, I fast <laughs> approaching. I, yeah. yeah, I think most people have sort of pl- seen us plodding along over the last five mm. weeks or so, and you know, business as usual. But the fact is, we haven't seen any uh, each other for five weeks because we've both been away doing these various things. You've been chasing eclipses. I've been. Um, swimming around Alaska, thanks to a boat, and and Canada, and uh, taking in the sights. It's been wonderful. Indeed, um, you've uh, I, I know you've had a great time, uh, as indeed did I. We had a wonderful view of the sept- sorry the April twentieth eclipse off the coast of uh, Western Australia, and a marvelous tour around Arnhem Land and Kakadu, yeah. which was very very. I, I can imagine it's even this extremely, time of year. Yeah. yeah extremely it's, interesting. It's a toasty part of the world. I, I, I'll tell you about a few space related things that happened while mm-hmm. I was away. Uh, first thing in Calgary, we went to a restaurant called Major Tom, which um, <laughs> they gave us that. Uh, it, it's named after the um, uh, Space Oddity uh, song Indeed. by David Bowie. But it's been yeah. named uh, Calgary's top restaurant for the last two years running. And we had uh, the can, uh, Canadian national dish what while we were there, which uh, is rather lovely. It's just a sort of a, a Canadian take on chips with <laughs> stuff on it, but it's a bit more a bit more advanced than um, chips with gravy like we have. Uh, I tried to look at the northern lights while we were up around Alaska. There were a couple of nights where it was really active, but uh, I missed it for two reasons. I think I looked at the wrong time and possibly the wrong direction. And uh, the next night it was raining, so that was disappointing. But when we were in Jasper, I ran across a couple of young people who were standing over behind a counter at the uh, reception of the accommodation we stayed at, and they run the Jasper Planetarium. Oh, uh, yeah. So a big shout out to Jerry and Kayleen. I spoke to them for a few minutes. I'd had a couple of wines, so I'm not sure I made much sense. But um, there it is, <laughs> the Jasper Planetarium. So if you're ever in Jasper, uh, go and check it out. Uh, They've got a website, jasperplanetarian.com. 
So, um, yeah, worth uh, worth having a chat to them. They're lovely people, and uh, it was really enjoyable to catch up. And I told them all about Space Nuts, so they've uh, certainly committed to not listening. And um, <laughs> I went to the Space Needle in Seattle. I've even got a Seattle hat. I always get a I always get a cap wherever I go. So um, the Space Needle's amazing. Uh, built in 1962, 63, for the World's Fair. Um, oh, yes. As was our hotel built for the World's <laughs> Fair, okay. uh, which was the Edgewater, where the Beatles famously got a photo taken hanging out the window of their hotel fishing. <laughs> and I got a photo of that photo. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> so that's that's my journey in a nutshell. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Yeah, yeah it was great. Wonderful. Really fabulous. Uh, yeah. A few people might have caught some of the pictures on Facebook because I did share them. Mm-hmm. Uh, let us get stuck into it because we're under the gun. And uh, first up, Saturn has reclaimed its title as the biggest mooner in the solar system. <laughs> naughty, naughty Saturn. It, that's right. It's uh, I, This is a story that I have to say, Andrew, that this really surprised me yeah? when, uh, when I saw it. Uh, because the headline is, <clears throat> well, one of the headlines, <clears throat> excuse me, Saturn reclaims its title of Moon King with the discovery of 62 new moons orbiting the planet, bringing oh. the total to, 100, to 145. Oh. Now, now, you know, for, was it 13 years, we had a marvellous spacecraft in orbit around Saturn uh, that had some very sensitive cameras and um, did sterling work on uh, our understanding of the planet and its rings and its moons. Uh, and I would have thought that if there were any small undiscovered moons lurking around in uh, around Saturn, Cassini, the name of the spacecraft, uh, would have found them. Yeah. Um, and uh, that is why uh, it took me quite by surprise. It, in fact, I'll be honest with you, it took my breath away. Uh, 62 moons? Mm. How does that work when we've had a spacecraft patrolling around Saturn. And maybe just um, because um, maybe Linda Spilker's listening, who is the project scientist for uh, for Cassini and a, and a good friend, uh, um, the, the problem with a spacecraft like Cassini uh, is that um, it, it's got all these really high-resolution cameras. It does have some wide-field cameras, but it can't look at everything at once. Yeah. Uh, and so the science that it was doing was targeted towards understanding the rings, understanding... Uh, all the other bits, of course, um, we got marvellous photographs of all of those things, Saturn, its moons, uh, everything. Uh, and uh, uh, re- remember uh, Carolyn Porco? She was the image scientist for Cassini and became very celebrated as somebody who's produced some of the most marvellous images in the solar system. But it can't look everywhere at once. Um, and that's actually why um, our good friend Trevor Barry uh, over there in Broken Hill became world famous, yes. uh, an amateur astronomer who was able to look at Saturn with his uh, his telescope uh, in Broken Hill and and alert the Cassini team to storms and other things of interest like that. Uh, now, so so I, I guess in that regard, um, Cassini is absolved from any responsibility for missing these 62 moons. Um, but uh, the, the other thing that I was really uh, impressed by um, was the way in which these moons uh, have been discovered. Because they were discovered not by a spacecraft in orbit around Saturn, not by the James Webb Space Telescope, not by some fancy piece of kit somewhere, but a telescope not very different from our own Anglo-Australian telescope here in New South Wales. Mm. Um, uh, and it is the 3.6-metre Canada-France-Hawaii telescope, which has got a nice Canadian flavour to it. Yes, uh, maple. Uh, we- that's right, Maple. Uh, it's a team that uh, is actually led by scientists from uh, Taiwan. Uh, and um, what they did was they used the telescope uh, to um, essentially not track on the stars, which is what you do when you're taking a photograph of the stars. You actually get the telescope to track uh, at the same rate at which the Earth is turning. Uh, so that you you pick up images of stars as dots, points of light, because usually your exposures might be 15, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour, uh, to build up the faint light on your uh, image sensor. Uh, 
much different from taking a picture with your mobile phone where it's kind of instantaneous. It's mm. uh, This is long exposure photography. And so um, what would happen if you did that and there was a moon of Saturn in the field of view, that moon has got its own motion. And so it's moving against the background of the stars. And that means that the light that falls on the detector is constantly shifting across the detector. And so it just is too faint to be picked up. So what these scientists did was to calculate how they could move the telescope so it would pick up uh, the motion of typical moons around Saturn. And that's how they got the 62 uh, as yet unseen moons, which are I don't think they're very big. I think they're of order a kilometre or so in size, tiny little worlds, mm. um, which may have originated possibly in a collision between bigger moons that has essentially, uh, you know, demolished s something else to make lots, lots and lots of smaller moons. Um, and one reason they think that might be the case is because so several of these moons have got similar orbits. They're, they're moving in paths around Saturn that have kind of similarities, suge suggesting that they might have come from the same impact event. Uh, it seems unlikely that they were formed with Saturn itself because they're in orbits that are very different from, uh, the, you know, from the uh, like the rings and the and the the moons that sit in the rings. So that may well answer my question as to how you differentiate um, a. a a moon around Saturn from the rubble that we know of as the rings. Um, so obviously it comes down to size, constitution, it, orbit, and and orbit. That's right. So um, I mean, the you know the thing about the rings is yes, you're right. There there are millions of what you might call little moonlets in the rings because they're chunks of ice hmm. uh, up to uh, up to about ten meters, I think, in size. Um, but there, but there are moons that sit within the rings, and these are much bigger objects uh, that actually sit in the ring system. And um, the, in fact, some of the, it's because of the moons uh, in the ring system that you get gaps in the rings as well. There's this sort of gravitational interaction between these things, which were, all these were beautifully captured by images from Cassini. Uh, so I think the objects that we're talking about now are in very different orbits. I, I can't remember the details, but some of them are quite a long way from Saturn, but they're definitely in orbit around Saturn. They've been tracked over a long enough period of time that you can see that they're actually circulating around the planet and not just random asteroids that are in the same field of view. Do they have to be a certain size to be considered a moon or do they just, just have that's... to be a rock in orbit? A certain yeah, orbit? Um, that's a good question because... You know uh, what I've just said—that some of the chunks of ice in in uh, Saturn's rings are maybe ten meters across. You might want to call that a moon because it's uh, you know it's a sizable object. Um, but I think um, the probably the the uh, if I can put it this way the the the, the categorization of what constitutes a moon um, is probably something that is that's distinguishable as a single entity, mm. which these tiny chunks of rock around in the rings aren't. So, um, I, I, and of course, you can do that either by its size or by its orbit, or as you said, by its composition, if it turned out to be rocky, which the rings aren't, that they've got a lot of dust in them, but they're not rocky. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, there must be a, an IAU, International Astronomical Union, definition of what a moon is, and I'm sure in the case of Saturn, it's one that they've had to work hard on so that they don't include the ring particles as moons. Um, so yeah, that, anyway, that, that could get very messy. It would be messy indeed. Yeah. Um, so what we're left with is a new value for the number of moons around Saturn, which makes my book Spacewalk completely out of date now. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's gone up to 145, yes. uh, which contrasts with Jupiter, which I think is 95 at the moment. Yeah, it's in the 90s, I remember. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, does this suggest perhaps, Fred, that there are going to be more moons to be discovered around Saturn and Jupiter? It's it's possible, Andrew, and you you might think, well, yes, Jupiter's nearer, so they should be easier to find if there are any tiny objects of this kind in orbit around in orbit around Jupiter. But um, just bearing in mind that these sixty-two newly discovered moons of Saturn, quite a significant fraction of them, 
are thought to be the result of a single collision uh, where, you know, maybe two bigger moons have collided and blown and destroyed themselves. Yeah. It re resulted in many, many fragments. So that's a particular event. And Jupiter might not have had things like that happening in its past. So, that you know, we, we, we may be at a stage there that there really is very little left to discover around the orbit, uh, around Jupiter in terms of moons. Mm. Um, well, I guess it, uh, it remains to be seen, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous discovery, and Saturn regain, regains its title. Of course, if you want to see more moons than that, um, just go down the main street of Dubbo on a Saturday night. Yep. <laughs> Plenty of new moons there. You make it sound very attractive, Andrew. <laughs> dear, dear. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. This episode of Space Nuts is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. Now, I'm sure you've heard my brother Steve in the last few weeks mentioning uh, our love of documentaries, uh, documentaries growing up. I, I certainly remember uh, 12 noon Sundays, switching the TV on to watch National Geographic and Jacques Cousteau and all of those amazing people who went out uh, to learn about things that helped me learn about the world. Well, Curiosity Stream is just that. It is the very best place for you to go and watch documentaries, and they cover a, a myriad of subjects, uh, technology, nature, travel, history, science, and that uh, includes um, the uh, exclusivity. Curiosity, Curiosity Stream has exclusive award-winning films and shows that you can't watch anywhere else. Uh, plus um, a really big collection of some of the best documentaries from all over the planet. Um, probably better than any other streaming service out there, which is a big call, but they're going to back it up. And they add new shows every week. And seriously, you will find something that you want to watch. It it honestly covers just about every facet of human interest. Uh, it's uh, an entertainment brand for people who want to know things, want to know more, want to learn about the world, learn about nature, learn about space. And it's available to watch uh, on the web uh, or on TV through uh, a, a whole bunch of platforms. You can get it through Roku, Xbox, uh, any smart TV, basically, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and a, and a bunch more. You can uh, get it through your mobile device, and it's available worldwide. Doesn't matter where you're from or where you're sitting right now, you can get Curiosity Stream. And again, I'll mention some of the areas uh, that it covers, and a couple more. Science, nature, history, technology, uh, military history, music. I'll be checking out military history. I can tell you that. That's one of my favorite subjects. And uh, yes, as I also mentioned, they add new shows every week. So check it out. It is called Curiosity Stream. And uh, as a Space Nuts listener, you get 25% off. Just use the promo code Space Nuts when you log on to curiositystream.com slash Space Nuts. curiositystream.com slash Space Nuts. And use the promo code Space Nuts for unlimited access to some of the world's top, top documentaries and uh, non-fiction series, uh, all available to you as a Space Nuts listener. And thanks again to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring today's episode. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Let's, uh, Fred, move on to our next topic. And I think we can get one of our audience members to introduce this one. This, oh, is, great. Uh, this <laughs> is Russ. Hi, Fred and Andrew. It's Russ here from Stourbridge in uh, Birmingham, the UK. Love the show, guys. Um, I was just wondering if there was any update on the gamma ray burst known as uh, the boat, the biggest of all time, that we detected last month. Um, and there seemed to be some evidence of super high energy particles that we detected that could potentially explain um, what dark matter is. Um, I haven't heard anything about it since, so I was just wondering if you could give us an update. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, Russ. It's uh, coincidental that Russ should send that question in because uh, Fred had put it on the topic list for us for this week uh, before I knew the question had arrived. So uh, he's right on the money. Uh, the largest cosmic explosion yet seen. Not the brightest, uh, but the biggest. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, we are... Um, talking about two different things here. Oh, yeah, are we? <laughs> yeah. He said both, though. 
Yes, but this is not the boat. This is one that beats the boat into fix. Uh, well, we can talk about both. <laughs> we should talk about both boats, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, um, our, I forgot, so I'm begging your pardon, I forgot. What, what's the, that gentleman's name there who's Russ. talking to us? Russ. Thank you, Russ. Um, Russ is uh, he's on the money in that uh, we're seeing some very bright uh, events. Uh, the, the, the gamma ray burst that Russ is talking about um, nicknamed Boat for Brightest of All Time, that took place last October, or it was detected last October. Right. Um, but it was a gamma ray burst. It was a brief flash of gamma radiation. I don't know, because I didn't pick up on the details there. I haven't had time to look at this since you've only just re- raised it again. Um, it, um, I don't know um, whether there was an optical counterpart found. What that means is finding a visible light equivalent. Yeah. And I hadn't heard about the implications for dark matter. So uh, thanks, Russ, for the heads up on that. We might follow uh, that up. I will follow up on that. Absolutely. Mm. We'll do that, try to do that for next for next time. Well, it's a, but, it's a good thing I made that blunder because they're both being called boats. Well, this one's called AT two O two one LWX, which oh. is not spelt B O A T. Yeah, but <laughs> biggest of all time would fit. Yeah, well, it, well, actually, boat was brightest of all time. I know. So, so this might be biggest of all time. You could be right because yeah. it is. That's the uh, exactly uh, what, how how it's being portrayed. Now, <clears throat> just coming back to Earth, if we can, um, I might read you the title of the paper in which these results were published. It begins, we present observations from X-ray to mid-infrared wavelengths of the most energetic non-quasar transient ever observed. Um, So a transient is is something where there's radiation, um, which uh, usually comes and goes, which is where the transient uh, term comes from. But this has come and has not yet gone. Uh, it, it's an explosion that has been taking place uh, for the last three years. Um, basically, it was uh, an event uh, that was spotted actually again by a telescope in California uh, that has similarities with one of the telescopes that we have here at Siding Spring Observatory in New South Wales, not the Anglo-Australian telescope, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, but the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope, uh, which I used to work on uh, in very great detail back in the 70s, uh, sorry, uh, 80s and 90s. Um, So there's a telescope in California that is almost identical. In fact, our Schmidt Telescope was a copy of it, effectively, although Mm. there were mods made. Uh, This thing is now called the Zwicky Transient Facility, uh, and it's uh, on the Ocean Schmidt Telescope at Mount Palomar. And uh, that uh, basically is used to record the sky uh, uh, over repeatedly over you know relatively short time intervals to look for things that come and go uh, and so that might include supernovae exploding stars it might include asteroids uh, I think they churn out many asteroids uh, discoveries in their in their work but um, back in 2020 um, the telescope was doing its usual automated sky sweep and it picked up this bright object, uh, which um, shocked people because when they followed it up, mm. they discovered that it was, um, I think it's 8 billion light years away. Light? Is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a long, long way off. Um, and that uh, meant that the the basically the, the energy that they were recording um, is very, very high. Uh, and uh, one of the lead authors of this work, uh, Philip Wiseman, who's at uh, the University of Southampton in the UK, um, he made the comment uh, that the the, the estimate for its brightness is, wait for it, two trillion times brighter than the sun. Good Uh, grief. Yeah. And so, you know, what is it? Well, uh, what they've done very wisely is followed up uh, in uh, wavelengths, as it said, from X-rays up to uh, up to uh, mid infrared, and um, uh, that rules out some of the possibilities. It's, it's by doing that that you find out that it's eight billion light years away because you, you measure its redshift, mm. uh, and so uh, it's really an extraordinary object. Um, and uh, um, the, the sheer energy of what it's putting out rules out 
the possibility of it being a supernova, uh, a, a, an exploding star, uh, because it's 10 times brighter. And with supernovae, exploding stars, they generally uh, come up to peak brightness. Um, there are many different kinds of supernovae, so they all behave slightly differently, but they usually fade within a matter of days or weeks after that peak brightness. This thing um, is kind of still going. It's actually, it has started fading, yeah. uh, but it's, its fade is very gradual. It's occupying hundreds of days. The best bet that they have in terms of in, in interpreting what it is is okay, you start with the most energetic objects we know about, um, which are black holes. Uh, so a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy, which incidentally they can't see, uh, so that's weird as well. But if you've got a supermassive black hole um, with a disk of material around it, that, as, as we know, because we've talked about this many times, this stuff swirls around, uh, is raised to very high energies by the friction uh, that's caused during this... Uh, swirling around it's called the accretion disk um uh, and then some of it disappears into the black hole some of it gets shot out uh, by magnetic fields but the bottom line is you get a lot of energy coming from these things mm. and that's what we normally call a quasar uh a, 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 an outburst in the center of a galaxy that comes from uh, material being sucked in but they are variable on much t shorter time scales than this one um, and so the interpretation is that, yes, this is the scenario you've got, a supermassive black hole, stuff swirling around it. But what has um, actually gone into this disk of swirling material is a very, very large, um, what we call a giant molecular cloud, a cloud of gas, basically. Uh, and that they, uh, in fact, they, I'll just read the last sentence of the abstract of, of uh, the paper by... Uh, Philip Wiseman et al. Uh, it says a plausible scenario is the accretion of a giant molecular cloud by a dormant black hole, in other words, one that's not been doing too much before that, um, of 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9th solar masses. Uh, that's the size of the um, that's the size of the black hole. It's uh, of the order of a billion solar masses. Uh, and so you've got a large cloud of gas. Uh, that is so big that it takes a long time for the black hole to gobble it up. Um, uh, they, they make the comment, AT 2021 LWX thus represents an extreme extension of the known scenarios of black hole accretion. In other words, it is really a one-off, and that's why it is a record holder. Extraordinary. Yeah, that's a huge, huge boom. Um, I, I guess they'll do some more study and try and confirm their theories. That's what you do, I suppose. And uh, yeah. maybe we'll know in the future exactly what happened. Yeah, that's right. I mean, what we what we're seeing at the moment is <clears throat> we've got what are called light curves here, which are still uh, being produced, um, uh, and a light curve of this object showing how it's increased in brightness, and its increase was relatively. Um, relatively general. It took something like a hundred days to to get from not being visible at all up to uh, the kind of brightness that it has now. Uh, so it's a, a gentle increase, uh, uh, but is now being followed by an even more gentle decrease in brightness. So these are all measurements of what we call its magnitude. It's uh, it's, it's brightness, like the Roman there candle. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's right. Unlike most, you know, most. Uh, Supernovae, which are more like um, uh, what we used to call a banger, but I think yeah. here is called a bunger. A bunger. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. There'll probably be more to come on that particular story. This is Space Nuts Andrew Dunkley with Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a quick break from the show to talk about our sponsor, NordVPN, which I know you know about because we've been talking about it for a long time and with very good reason. It is the best virtual private network available. And as a Space Nuts listener, you get a special deal, including a 30-day money-back guarantee. All you have to do is log on to the special uh, URL that is set up for Space Nuts listeners and click on Get the Deal to find out all about it. Uh, NordVPN.com slash Space Nuts, which I'll repeat uh, uh, shortly. Uh, I've just come back from overseas, as you're probably aware. Uh, we were in Canada and Alaska, and we used a lot, 
a great deal of public Wi-Fi while we were away. Uh, airports, uh, hotels, motels, eateries, you name it. And I had my uh, NordVPN set up to automatically connect regardless of what I was doing or where I was from. And it made me feel very, very safe indeed. Not only that, uh, I had seamless connectivity. I had no problems whatsoever with using the internet, uploading, downloading, posting pictures, receiving emails, uh, you name it, communicating with the family. It was fantastic. It is a very, very good tool uh, to have, especially if you travel, but even for your own peace of mind at home on all your devices, your computer, your laptop, your smart devices, including uh, tablets and phones, and even your smart TV. So click on Get the Deal on the URL nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Look at the options available. I've uh, got the complete package for two years, which gives me extra time on top of that as part of the deal. Uh, but um, you, you can go through and find out exactly what you need and uh, choose the plan accordingly. Uh, I'm sure you won't be disappointed. NordVPN.com slash Space Nuts. Now back to the show. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, let's uh, get into the Q&A session where we uh, hand it over to uh, the audience to come up with some uh, questions for us. And the first one comes from Clyde. Hi, Fred and Andrew. It's Clive from England. Um, thanks so much for the show. I love it. I'm an avid follower. Um, Fred said something very interesting uh, in the last episode, which is about um, black holes made from dark matter. And it struck me there wouldn't, as far as I can guess, be any difference between a black hole made of dark matter and a black hole made of ordinary matter. So does that imply that black hole? well, are they the same first? And does it imply that black holes could be hoovering up dark matter as well as ordinary matter i'd love to know what you think about that it's a great conjecture by uh, fred so thank you very much <laughs> cheers thank you clyde uh dark matter and black hole questions are not uncommon and here mm. we've here we've put the two together Got them both yeah which is great actually um and it, I kind of, in some ways, ties in with that paper we discussed recently that also says that dark energy might be due to black holes. Yes, that's so, right. You know, maybe um, maybe black holes uh, are really the secret of everything. All the big questions that we've got, the only one that they might not answer is, are we alone? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, yeah, so Clyde, that's, you know, your thinking along those lines is interesting because I think, I think you're right that um, given that... And the the phenomenon about excuse me the phenomenon about dark matter that reveals its dark matter is its gravitation and gravitation is all you need to make a black hole. So um, that's a Beatles song, isn't it? Gravitation is all you need. <laughs> yeah, gravitation gravitation is all you need. A hit song uh, in 1967. I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, it winds up with. Um, I think it's in the mood. It's one of the old uh, old swing band songs that comes in at the end there, as well as uh, "She Loves You." Yeah, yeah, that's gravitational, right. Gravitationally. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I forgot where we got to. Yeah, that. Yeah, so the gravitation. Uh, all right, gravitation is what generates a black hole, um, and yes, why not have? Um, dark matter in black holes i really need to follow up on this because there will be work on it in the in the literature um um y y y you know is there any reason why we don't think that dark matter is swallowed up by black holes and uh does that mean that you know the in the gravitational pot gravitational potential well that is a black hole there's a mixture of normal and dark matter which kind of makes sense because there's a mixture of it outside black holes as well yeah uh, in fact we know it's here uh, uh and there where you are um it's wherever normal matter is uh great question and um let me follow up again on that and see whether we can get some answers on it okay <clears throat> thank you clyde uh couldn't come up with all the answers today but uh, we're talking black holes and dark matter so <laughs> there's still a lot of unanswered 
questions regarding that and uh, dark energy, of course. Let's go now to Mikey. Hey, Fred and Andrew. It's Mikey from Illinois. Um, so a while back now, you guys had an episode on asteroid redirection and asteroid threats and how we would avoid such things. And you guys had mentioned uh, nuclear bombs, you know, could be an option. And it got me thinking, and I've been thinking about it ever since, and I've been meaning to ask you guys this, but time time just gets away from you. But uh, if we did have to send a nuclear bomb on a rocket to destroy an asteroid that was too big to redirect or, you know, whatnot, um, rockets fail. And unfortunately, we've seen this before in the past, and it got me wondering what happens if a rocket fails with a nuke strapped to it when we're trying to redirect an asteroid or destroy an asteroid in this case. Um, I guess there's just always that potential and I'd never thought about it. I mean, is, am I right in this? In that, you know, there could be a rocket failure in a scenario like this. And then what happens here on earth? I mean, I guess it would depend on how big the nuke is. I, I mean, what kind of destruction would we be looking at? Am I, am I thinking right? Like, that is definitely a possibility. Um, just a quick what if, you know, that never crossed my mind. And I uh, hope you guys have a good one. Enjoy the podcast. Thank you. Oh, Mikey got cut off, but thank you, Mikey. And thank you for putting that terrible nightmare into my brain. Um, <laughs> yeah. First and foremost, if we were to put a nuke on a rocket, I wouldn't be contracting Elon Musk to send it up at the moment. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, the rockets fail. It's it's a fact of life, and uh, most don't. But you don't really want one carrying something like this to fail. But Fred, I would uh, suspect that the way they make nuclear weapons, there are lots of fail safes built in. Yeah, I think that's true, Andrew. And uh, so, uh, notwithstanding the possibility of it cracking open and the um, that's right, the nuclear the energy being material. released some yeah. other way. Um, so, so a number of points to pick up on here. One is uh, just, just um, I don't often leap to Elon's defence, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I mean, his whole philosophy of making reliable rockets is to test by failure. Yeah, um, and it's a different scenario from the way NASA works, uh, but he can do it because he's not using public money well he is to some extent but you know what i mean it's a private company yeah uh, and so the you know the spectacular failure on the 20th of april of the uh, starship the first starship flight um which failed because uh, of, of a fault in the second stage separating from the first it wasn't actually the rocket itself that mm. blew up uh, it failed to separate and so that produced an instability and they had to de destroy the rocket um, but Elon will take stuff from that and learn from it. And, uh, you know, hopefully next time it'll have a better outcome. Yeah. Uh, now, that's, I, I, uh, I, look, I was, it was tongue in cheek, but I, I do have a yeah. lot of respect for him. And yeah, um, Absolutely. I know. I just, and just to set them. It wasn't until I was in Canada and Alaska that I saw why he's got so much money to pour into rockets because the number of Teslas on the road is outstanding. Oh, that's, amazing. That's great. They are yeah, everywhere. That's, it's great news. I mean, you know, that's why we respect Elon for exactly those reasons. Mm. Uh, we've got all these electric cars. We've got reusable spacecraft. It is amazing. There's other things that we don't quite feel so respectful about. But that's all right. That's all. Anyway, but you're right. Um, you know, rockets, uh, uh, you've got, what you've got is a, <laughs> you've got a, a bomb uh, uh, sitting there with something very precious on top of it, whether that's a human or a nuclear warhead. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're always running risks. Um, I think the bottom line is, though, uh, and, it, and it is possible that we might need nuclear weapons, not actually to, to demolish an asteroid, but to deflect it yeah. um, by the shock wave, the blast, uh, you, you explode the the device next to it and the shock wave actually pushes the asteroid or accelerates it slightly. And um, you and I covered a story probably a few months ago where it turns out that rubble pile asteroids are actually more resilient to that mm. kind of thing than yes. you think they would be because you think they just fall to bits, but they actually are, uh, apparently would be easier to deflect. And that's something that will feed into the whole idea of planetary protection. Um, so I, I think the, 
you know, the crux of the matter here is that you would only be doing that in extremis. Uh, you would only uh, think about sending nuclear weapons into space because it kind of contravenes the you know international space law effectively. Uh, you would only do it if that was the only way to avoid an impact uh, by uh, an asteroid down the track, which might uh, result in much higher loss of life than a nuclear explosion on a on a launch pad. Yeah, um, but we're talking bureaucrats here. We want to send a nuclear weapon into space to deflect an asteroid that is going to destroy humanity. No, you can't do it. It says so right there. Nah. Well, that, that's that. That's right. And that might be the answer in the end. Hmm. Uh, but you, but it, it would have to be literally the only option. Um, possible option. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. But, but as, yeah, Mikey, as for the rocket failing with a nuclear weapon on board, the bombs are designed not to explode uh, if there's an, a disaster. But whether or not the cataclysmic explosion or whatever it is that brings the rocket down causes the nuclear warhead to crack open and expose us to radiation, that's another matter. Yes, that's right. Mm. It is. And, and those are all possible scenarios. You, you're absolutely right. So Mikey's raised an interesting, you know, it's almost a philosophical, or sorry, an ethical question really, isn't yeah, it? About it is. whether, we should, whether we should do that. Is, is the risk worth the reward in the end? And I think that would be the equation that would have to be sorted out by... Yes, the bureaucrats and uh, and anybody else who's involved with it. Mm. Because the other option, and we can't do it now, but we could just build the bomb in space and launch it from beyond our atmosphere, perhaps. That might that that might also be possible. That's that's a good suggestion. I mean, um, I don't know centrifuge uranium centrifuges in space to refine uranium. That sounds like the sort of thing that would also raise hackles. Yeah. You, you know, I think you'd need to be in a in a scenario where the world was united in realizing that this was the only way uh, to deflect this asteroid and avo avoid a, a catastrophe, yeah. uh, because otherwise you'd have, uh, like you know, the committee that I was involved with at the beginning of the year, COPWAS, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Yes, uh, sending a, a nuclear weapon to an asteroid is part of the peaceful uses of outer space. Uh, but is not, uh, it's, um, sorry, I'm just going to do that. Uh, it's not um, uh, something that would normally be thought of as a peaceful venture to send a nuclear rocket into space. And, yeah. uh, sorry, a nuclear missile into space. Indeed. Uh, good question, Mikey, and very interesting to discuss, and maybe we'll get to talk more on it um, in the future. Finally, Fred, uh, we've, we've had questions about the movie The Martian several times and discussed some of the feasibility of the things they, they portrayed in that film, including growing potatoes on the moon. Uh, Paul has an observation. G'day, Professor Fred and Andrew. This is Paul from Sunny Bruce Vegas in Queensland, Australia. I have a question about that awesome movie, The Martian. There is one thing that has been baffling me, and it's this... At the start of the movie, there's this spaceship that's being threatened by this huge dust storm and these, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto winds that are going to knock it over. So the astronauts had to get on board and <laughs> leave Matty Damon in the you-know-what, quite literally. I get the impression that that's just not going to happen because Mars's atmosphere is, what, 2% of Earth, so there's very little air pressure. And the winds just can't push over anything that heavy, let alone the rovers that are already on there. Am I right? And uh, if I am right, is that okay? It's not like they were making a movie like Star Trek or Star Wars, which is more like, you know, space opera rather than science fiction. So are they doing to scientists and science a little bit of a disser disservice by um, budging things like that? Uh, when they try and get everything else right. I don't know. It's probably nothing. But nevertheless, I just thought it was food for thought. So keep up the excellent work, gentlemen, and have a good one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. It's a, it's a great question, and it brings up another element that I had trouble with, and that was um, 
at the end of the film, his rescue, where he had to drive 3,000 miles to get to another um, uh, rocket ship to take him off the planet, which they'd already deployed on the planet, which didn't make sense to me. How can you already deploy uh, an Earth return vehicle when there was nobody to return and they've got a... No, it didn't. It didn't gel. It was just sort of a throwaway, oh, we better figure out a way to get a rocket to him. Well, let's already have it there. So that part of the story I thought was a bit iffy. Um, but yes, the storms on Mars, they can be quite volatile though, can't they, Fred? Um, yes, they, they certainly um, they are capable of producing global dust storms, which tells you that they're significant. Uh, Paul's Absolutely right, though the pressure is low. It's actually 0.6% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. Um, the reason why we can get global dust storms blown up by winds in such a rarefied atmosphere is that the dust is very fine. Hmm. Uh, it's extremely fine, uh, very easy to, to lift up. Uh, we've got these dust devils that we see on Mars, uh, little whirlwinds. Um, so, but you, uh, Paul's absolutely right, you know. Um, Winds, even though they might be quite high speed, but with within an atmosphere that thin, are not going to knock over solid pieces of steel or is titanium right? or whatever it is. Oh. Um, so they're they're they're, 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 they're winds, but I, I think I think Paul's right that um, you know that scenario wouldn't bit, happen. Bit of there were a lot license. of there were a lot of other things. The one thing that bothered me about the Martian. Um, and it's along the same lines. If I remember rightly, there was a bit where he had a almost like a tent or something which had a hole in it, which he patched up with a sheet of. of oh, that uh, was that was in the habitat where he was growing oh, potatoes, and the uh, the entryway, the um, um, airlock, blew off, and yeah. he patched it up with plastic. But wasn't it the outside? That he patched up. Yes, yeah. He put the plastic on the <laughs> on the what was the opening to the the airlock yeah. and patched yeah. it up with plastic and and tied it down yeah. with. I mean, it's essentially it's essentially a vacuum yeah. out there, um, so that bit of plastic would have bulged and probably burst uh, mm. just by virtue of the atmospheric pressure within it. Uh, so that upset me a bit, and yeah. you were clearly upset by the logic of having a spacecraft there already so, unmanned, yeah, ready or, to take, already, ready, ready, conveniently ready to take him home. It just <laughs> yeah, just I'd, I mean, so you, you've got to take a little bit of um, latitude in in creating the story. A lot of it was well researched, and they did a fabulous job. And the growing of potatoes angle actually would work. Yes, so we so we're here. Mm. Um, so, but Paul's, you know, Paul's bigger question is the philosophy of of uh, of how you portray a science fiction or a space opera type scenario. Whether mm. whether we are playing to something completely fictional or whether we're a mixture of both, which I guess The Martian was a bit like uh, the movie Gravity. That was a mixture of fact and fiction. I well. think it had a lot more creative license added to it than The yeah. Martian. Yeah, though. some yeah, of some right. of the stuff they pulled off there was probably you know one in a trillion chance of surviving scenarios, and she did it four times. <laughs> yeah, but um, the one that and I always come back to this one, the one that stuck with the physics uh, at least for the first. I guess eighty percent of the movie was was uh, two thousand and one: A Space Odyssey because that that everything that was in there mm. was feasible, uh, and it was only at the end where we went off into, you know, a different dimension of space time, yeah. um, courtesy of the aliens. And uh, that was the bit that, it, 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 and it didn't worry me at all in that because I accepted the fact that yeah, we're we're in new territory here, so we can't. You know, we can't call the old. That that movie was actually one of the options on my flight to, oh, from it? Canada, and I was going to watch it, but uh, I fell asleep, which which is good. I actually slept coming home. I slept for seven hours and tricked my brain into thinking I was still in uh, Western Canadian time. And when I woke up, it was um, early morning in Sydney, and I was in sync. So I actually managed to trick my brain into avoiding jet lag this time around. <laughs> Well done. Yeah. I, seven hours sleep on a plane in a 15-hour flight. I was that's, very impressed. I've never done that before. That's very good. Probably yeah. never will again. <laughs> mm. Thank you, Paul. That was a great question. And uh, you were right. Yes, the, the storms up there would not knock the rocket over. 
Uh, I, and the other thing I noticed is because um, you said the the storms only have mine, you know, minor dust particles. They were, this one was lifting up rocks. Yes, yeah. <laughs> like the size of a um, a coin type of thing. So that was a bit of a misnomer as well. Fred, that uh, wraps it up. Uh, don't forget, if you've got questions for us, uh, please send them to us via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. And you can uh, send uh, text and audio questions that way. And don't forget to have a look around while you're there. And uh, if you want to think about becoming a patron of Space Nuts, um, by all means, uh, look into that as well. We'll never force you to pay for it. But uh, if you want to voluntarily put some money in the kitty, to pay for a new internet connection or something, uh, that uh, would be <laughs> most welcome. <laughs> yes. We've had a fun time today. We um, definitely have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks to Hugh back in the studio. As always, he's had five weeks off, and, of course, today he thought he was still having time off, and that's probably why we dropped out five or six times during the recording. <laughs> uh, Fred, as always, thank you. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Sounds great, Andrew. I look forward to it. Uh, good to see you back again, and I love the cup. Oh, yes, I, I do too. It's a nice colour, and I loved Seattle. What a beautiful city. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. city. Please. See you soon, Fred. Take care. Bye for now. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, uh, part of the overwhelmingly large team of three here at Space <laughs> Nuts. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. Catch you on the very next episode. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.